Um, I'm Katie Thornton. I'm Head of Special Collections within the Leeds University Library. Um, what I'd like to do is take a very brief look at the sorts of things which we as the library are doing to give better digital access to our collections. Um, and then I've got a few comments that haven't already been raised, but I'll, I'll just see what I work in um, in response to the critical review. Um, it's fair to say that at this stage, our digital engagement is very much around making use of digitisation and online collections information to widen awareness of the collections and hopefully usage. Um, we are also creating resources which we hope will support teaching and research, but we are not yet at the stage of encouraging the rest of that feedback loop uh, where we're, we're sort of we're starting out um, in a good way, I hope. But but we, there are there are more. There's more we can do. Um, the university library has obviously had good database catalogues and in more recent years online catalogues for its print stock for for quite a long time, but the non-print collections have been somewhat hidden. Um, what I want to look at today are five different aspects. Our literary archive is one of our major collecting strengths, is um, 19th and 20th century literary archives. Our art collection, um, our use of the turning the pages software, our collections online initiative and digital archives. So just to move into the literary archives, we've been creating a suite of resources uh, to explore some of the literary gems in our collections. The work we're doing at the moment is being driven by our um, collection management software, which is KEEMU, which is where some of you, others of you may use. Um, the metadata and the contextual information about the objects is stored in the database. The images are stored in our digital library repository. The two are brought together online uh, in a seamless way to give access. Um, the fact that the data is stored in our collection management system means that it is not a one-off website. That data can be reused in other contexts and is also it's part of the catalogue. So one of the suites of resources that we've created um, explores some of the literary drafts in the collections, which obviously is a, a, a key tool in teaching, one of the reasons we've collected these um, uh, objects. Um, this is a, a resource is based on an evolving series of drafts for Graham Greene's novel, Dr. Fisher of Geneva, uh, one of his late novels, and it's a key feature of one of our 20th century literary collections. Um, it shows us what literary archives can do to support teaching and research. It takes us into the creative process behind that text. So on this page, you can see uh, particular drafts um, in their wider contexts, and then you can click through um, into an individual document and examine that in some detail. And from this page, it's possible to zoom in on the image, read a transcription, uh, read interpretative notes, or access related learning resources. There's a lot of curatorial intervention here, obviously. You can also look at the evolution of a particular phrase in detail, again, selected phrases uh, by the cur curator. Uh, really exploring the genealogy of the text and getting an understanding of Green's uh, craft as a writer and the, the effort that goes into the, the final printed uh, text. It is obviously useful for students of Green, uh, but it does have, we hope, more general application and understanding how to write. And it is also be, it is currently being used um, within one of the creative writing modules within the School of English. Uh, students looking at how that, how that emerges. We're also working on other digital resources um, based on our literary collections, um, looking at how we can explore them better to develop access, uh, mainly for teaching resources, but also eventually for research. Um, launching on Monday uh, is our first folio digital resource. Leeds is one of only six university libraries in the country to own a copy of the first folio of Shakespeare's plays. We've recently digitised it. Um, and we've been working on creating uh, digital resources to go round it, contextual and academic, pedagogical, um, so that that can go out beyond the university as well as within. We've consulted extensively with academics and with researchers, and we hope that we've resulted in an easily accessible resource um, and it, that incorporates the functionality which people require from it. You can navigate it by play, act, scene, page number and signature. Um, it's got high quality zoomable 
um, images to much larger than life. It's also got multimedia learning resources embedded around it to support undergraduate teaching. Um, it's free online. Other uh, repositories have also digitised their first folios. We feel that the resources we've put around it and the fact that it's free online and will remain so you know, make this a pretty valuable thing to have done. Um, our policy where possible is to put material online under Creative Commons licensing rather than behind any kind of paywall or subscription. At the moment with this resource there's no um, opportunity for sort of social media type interaction but that is something we can look at uh, developing in, in time to come. So as well as initial page um, and contextual information you can move into particular plays, you can see on the right you have the opportunity to move partic through particular scenes within the play and on the left you have um, you know, the, the title page of a particular play but you can then move into that into a full screen image and zoom in that's not its fullest zoom extent I stopped when you could see one column within the, within the screen you can take it up higher so anybody who's particularly interested in the evolution of the, the object the text, the paper, um, the glitches in the print in the font or whatever, uh, you can you can really zoom in on that. Um, we obviously don't expect this to replace access to the original. What we hope is that it enhances people's knowledge that we've actually got got it and enables them to explore it and you know create their own um, opinion of it. So that's um, we hope a very useful uh, development. This software that we're using, as I say, this is driven from our KEMU collection management system. We can use this. Um, software to showcase any of our other resources as well. It's a relatively simple process now we've developed it to bung in other things. Um, we're also looking at how we um, expand on, for example, the Graham Green type um, initiative. Um, we're going to be working with our uh, one of our more important 20th century literary archives, Simon Armitage's. Um, we're going to be working with Simon and academics and researchers to create an online resource which explores material in his archive relating to his adaptation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, and it'll incorporate multiple curatorial viewpoints, the poet's own, medievalists at the university, um, and teachers in the School of English. The intention is that this will be available by the time the International Medieval Congress meets in Leeds in July. Uh, Simon is also reading about Gawain uh, at that conference, so we thought it tied in very nicely. Great photo. So moving away from literary uh, matters into um, our art collection, uh, the university's art collection, which comes under the remit of the library, um, has been online to some extent under the Your Pictures initiative for several years now, uh, but it's now also on our website, driven by KEMU. Um, at the moment, it's very much a browse collection, browse catalogue function, functionality. Uh, I searched on Freud, uh, one of the Gregory Fellows at, uh, at, at the University of Leeds in the 50s. Um, we've just recently, this, this week, opened a retrospective of his work in the art gallery. Having discovered images you like the look of, you can then move into full screen uh, reproductions of them, digital reproductions of them. Um, what we're seeing with this is that the online resource uh, is resulting in much better awareness it's also resulting in increased research inquiries for access to items that aren't on the walls in the gallery uh, and also loan requests. So we're seeing the digital driving physical interaction, which I think is an interesting, um, or a desire for physical interaction with the objects, uh, an interesting development. Um, with this project, the copyright clearances are ongoing and the intention is that the majority of the works will be able to be displayed online uh, when we finish that. So again, very much around access, but we are seeing interesting results um, in terms of, of what people then want to do. We mentioned turning the pages, um, the British Library's software. We have two digital kiosks uh, using that software, one in our art gallery and one at the entrance to the Brotherton Library. Uh, we are using those, as Stella mentioned, to enhance access to the collections where if we have something out uh, and there are other things somebody could also explore, or if a book is open at a particular opening, the opportunity to show the, the rest of it um, is obviously very useful. We do see that as a supplementary experience rather than an, uh, an end in itself. Um, and we think that it does enhance the experience 
for the visitor or researcher. So again, use of that. Thinking of, we've, we've looked at how we can showcase particular sources in some detail, but we are developing, as with the art collection, more general digital access to um, digital surrogates, and we're calling these collections online. Again, driven by our EMU database, um, we have discussions, and we haven't resolved them, uh, about whether we do mass digitisation of an entire collection um, or of an entire book, or whether we cherry pick for illustrative purposes. Um, different reasons for doing that, um, supporting research or just supporting awareness and perhaps some teaching resources. I think, this, I think that's an interesting tension, and I don't think anybody really has a definitive answer to it. I think it's horses for courses. Um, we're aiming to um, encourage research projects to uh, for other people to create enhanced metadata um, and or fund digitisation. We also feel that gives us the opportunity for alternative voices within the catalogue, uh, people with particular expertise or experience who want to explore collections and share that with us. We can record it in EMU. The problem you we mentioned, um, Jamie, about, yes, you've got all this data, what do you do with it then? Yes, absolutely. We need to be able to manage that. Um, but it does maybe provide a better basic catalogue and a basic, better basic experience for other researchers. We do see that process as part of a conversation. Um, we put out enhanced catalogue data and digital surrogates. That enhances research, which encourages people visiting, uh, which encourages student volunteering, perhaps, um, and improved engagement with the physical collections. It's a, it's a virtuous circle. Um, we do then obviously have the opportunity to record additional metadata if we want to. The digital version really is a shop window and a research tool. Um, it's a catalyst for interaction with the original rather than a barrier or a replacement, which I think was, you know, was the aspect you were considering within your review. Um, in time, that conversation may well take place more in the virtual world, uh, but at the moment, we and our researchers value the physical access to the artefacts too much to just abandon that for purely virtual. Uh, we are ex also exploring the potential for EMU to drive digital labels and other interactive resources in our proposed new gallery space. So that's going to be an interesting one, how we can develop interactivity at that point as well. Um, the collections online, as you see, um, a simple catalogue re record, image attached, you can move through, look at a hierarchy, scroll through the whole collection. It's, it's for use as a digital surrogate, which obviously won't replace access to the original, but can enhance uh, improve your initial research before you actually visit. So finally, looking at digital archives, which we've mentioned already, we do have plans to manage born digital resources as well. Um, our particular collecting strength in modern literary archives leads us to this, as well as the institutional archive. Um, we're planning to have ingest and access workflows developed by the end of this calendar year. Because this material is naturally of more recent date, uh, we will be looking at controlled access to it rather than Creative Commons online uh, so that we can ensure legislative compliance. Uh, and obviously that is a big issue around more modern material. Um, this has the potential to be quite a sterile experience using digital archives um, electronically. None of the thrill of handling an original. Not so much opportunity for interpretative, or perhaps you know maybe there is, but I, it's, it, simply getting that stuff out there would be uh, a challenge in itself. The opportunity for text searching obviously does enhance research value. Um, one of the suggestions we're considering is um, a suggestion made by Simon Armitage, whose collection we have, we've talked about that already, is that we might use his old laptop in our reading room to give access to his digital archives that obviously have had to have been through an ingest process and copied back out again to reflect his file structure but it, instead of opening somebody's diary you might open their laptop and sit there and explore their file structure mm. I think it's an interesting one <laughs> what we do when the laptop dies I don't know um, but you know it's, it's a possibility uh, that we can think about um, so a virtual laptop, maybe. maybe a virtual laptop yes <laughs> um, but we, what we're seeing really is that the digital world is a vital part of discovering collections. Um, it's an adjunct and it offers an opportunity for potential for enhanced access and for interaction. It doesn't replace the physical for us yet, although it's, it's increasingly important. Um, it's increasingly important in the modern book world, uh, but it's also important in the special collections world. 
so that's what we're up to within the university library. Um, just a quick uh, couple of reactions to the critical review. Um, as I think we've already said, your review is compact. I think that if you did explore heritage as information, it could result in some quite different findings. And that may well be just one to flag for a future, but it, it depends on the definition of heritage, obviously. Um, on page two and three, you've got your key themes, your cu curator's toolbox. You've got a phrase about a valuable, valuable aspects that are specific to the digital. And I think that's quite true. There are things that digital can do that you cannot do in the analog world. Um, particularly in data terms. I'm thinking of um, historical data sets that are analog and dispersed, which can be digitized, re-keyed re effectively into um, structured data and then interrogated in a way that's never really been possible up to now. Uh, one particular project I've been involved in in a previous role is um, the Victorian tithe apportionments for a whole county, township by township, so a couple of hundred, um, which you bring together and archaeologists, social historians can track land use, land holdings, field names in a way that simply isn't possible when you're interrogating each one um, physically, see the patterns for the first time. Um, we've mentioned really the um, your past, present and future aspect about the idea that the digital is secondary. I think that can be true in some ways, but I think that it's particularly with digital archives, obviously, as we've said, it's primary. Um, but I think that the enabling of new ways of visualising and understanding heritage. For example, x-rays of, of pictures showing both changes and the artist's original intentions and things like that. You know, that you don't get that in any other way. Um, and your um, initial conclusions that the digital provides a space for experimentation. Yes, absolutely. Um, you mentioned the curatorial voice, and as we've said, it's not the only valid one. Um, the museum world and the archive world already have methodologies, the revisiting collections methodologies around enabling other voices to appear in the creation of cataloguing and contextual information. Um, those are obviously usable in a, in a digital crowdsourcing environment as well. So um, I think that the experimentation there is something that we should all be as professionals uh, and indeed as researchers uh, exploring. Right, um, so should we have a couple of minutes for questions to Katie and Stella? Feel free to stay there, Stella, we're already a little room. A little room. Um, so can I open it up? I've got a question, I don't know if it's so much for Katie, um, but just about the interpretation of how heritage has been defined within the study, because I've taken it actually in its broadest sense and I'm just interested in how you've approached it. What do you mean by heritage? I think that when we... Well, I mean, one thing which is clear to me is that we need a much tighter definition for the purposes of discussion to, to foreground the way, that we're, the way that we're using the word heritage. Um, I mean, I think that for the purposes of this draft, we've, we've kind of left it almost open-ended, yeah. simply because we want, we want this this document to really to re-examine what what reinterpretation of heritage the digital allows you to do. Um, I think that we've we've thought of it very much in terms of sites. I think actually that that the kind of encounters which we classify as, as heritage encounters take place in specific places associated with heritage. Um, so the museum, the the the, the stately home, the, um, the those kinds of places which are they kind of necessarily bound up with the past in some way, and there's yeah. a physical dimension to heritage. Um, because I mean, one of the one of the things which we flagged up right at the beginning was uh, we wanted to look at the the kind of differences between physical and digital representations of things. So to do that, if we take heritage to be a physical, to, to have some kind of physical location, um, that that was kind of an enabling factor. But I think we need to we need to kind of go back and revisit that quite um, quite extensively. Yes, that's helpful because I've, I've sort of taken the same interpretation pretty much as you've just said, but I expect each of us is probably going to stick some slightly different. Yeah. yeah I think we were partly guided by, um, I, think, I think it's true to say that the vast majority of our questionnaire respondents um, 
worked in museums or um, some kind of site. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's partly guided by that. Thank you. But I guess in some ways also we're trying to use the concept of heritage as a provocation in some yeah. ways to, for, I mean, I think it's brilliant. I already think this is really day to day because we, we precisely wanted this to say that actually this the, the way heritage seems to be kind of being defined isn't the way we understand heritage to work. Whatever that that was precisely what we're trying to do because as, as everyone will know, there's such a massive, vast amount of information out there, and so what we've been trying to do because we've only had kind of a few months to do this is to try and find ways to cut through it as quickly as possible. So the so we had to kind of have a stab at it, and we um, and. The, the more kind of um, critical comments we get, I guess, the more useful that is for us in order to, sign, to, to, to narrow things down. Can I, can I just say in, in response, I think that um, associating or, or basing your definition on, on sites, on physical places, um, might, might help. But also, it excludes an awful lot of charity. Um, and I'm not just thinking about um, libraries, I'm thinking about um, things like um, Ancestry UK, you know. Uh, so, very much grassroots heritage. And I, I, and, and I think you, you do need to, I mean, I don't know whether the literature is helpful or not, to be perfectly honest, but I, I suspect you actually need to. to Take a step back and just look at what the what what heritage means from um, from a grassroots point of view and the the, the people the folk in the in the street. And I suspect that it it means different things in different cultures as well, yeah. even within um, the UK. But I think that there is a danger in your current um, definition of of it being terribly white Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the rationales for that is that well. yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things which I kind of imagine that I don't I, this isn't something which we which kind of discussed as the, between the three of us was that actually because the the academic literature tends to think of heritage as being something tangible and something requiring um, input from a, from a curator in some way, or at least it, it, heritage is a creative thing. It's not a natural. Um, is that actually we can use this critical review to, to kind of blow that open a little bit and say, well, if you include di the digital as a, as a valid and viable form of engaging with heritage, then your understanding of heritage becomes much more transformative, much more democratic and much more open. Um, and that actually that's one of the things which, which the digital, at least in principle, has a potential to do is to kind of make our understanding of heritage that much more accessible for a diverse range of social and demographic groups. Um, yes, so, I mean, I'm yeah. just sitting here thinking that it, it also, I mean, it might be helpful for you just to actually um, take apart the concept of heritage and just look at the different categories. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, practitioners use different categories. You know, there's the built heritage, there's, you know, the, there's the, the natural heritage. We haven't talked about landscape. Landscape is very important as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's the the print heritage, the archive heritage. You know, I mean, you, you might be able to actually develop something that, that might actually enable you to say, well, for this purpose of this study, we're looking at this. Because I can completely understand that you know you've only got so much. There's only so many hours in a day, and you need to you need to narrow it sufficiently that you can get something useful. So it's probably that when you talk about the grey literature, but actually it might even be a grey heritage of course. Mm. Yeah. It's a huge amount of self-generated, you know, like community-type websites where people yeah. upload their own material. Mm. Yeah. And that, in terms of the kind of democratic heritage and, you know, be your curator from from the grassroots side. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Could, could I just make, make a, another point about the, um, the critical review or another category within the critical review? And I'm sure it's, it, it's, a, it's a comment that um, others will relate to as well. Is that another voice? And somebody has mentioned it, but I think it it, um, it should be kind of brought up your agenda. Is the funders? And there are some key funders these days, um, including the Heritage Lottery Fund, 
uh, we have a, a, a very big heritage report, a very big, um, I think that's um, been going in um, later this month. I know others in the room are working on. Um, and the Heritage Lottery Fund um, shapes agendas. Um, and it certainly shapes a digital agenda. Um, if you don't have um, digital engagement, digital elements within your bid, you basically lose marks. I mean, it's part of the tick box. So I think that actually you should, but there are other key um, funders as well, such as Esme Fairman, um, you know, such as the Arts Council. Um, and I think actually, you know, without their voice, in your view, you're, you're missing, um, there is a, uh, a gap. I mean, some of the, I hadn't thought about uh, stuff coming out of Esme Fair, but, but we, we're definitely including um, kind of arts council reports on um, attempts to engage new audiences with the arts, for example, as yeah. part of as part of the. Okay. Is that the kind of? Yeah, I mean, but I mean, Esme Fair, um, very influential, influential, I think, and you know, their programmes often determine the, the shape of um, projects within museums because we don't all sit there and think up, you know. Up, you know, it does allow experimentation, but that experimentation needs to be paid for. Mm. And you know, our fund that we live in, a, particularly in the AG world, you know, actually um, getting extra resource for these things is often the only way that you can do it. But also, I'm thinking about, I mean, Andrew Mellon. Um, yeah. There are some very yeah. big um, welcome. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm I'm chairing. Um, the, the, the project that I'm chairing um, is, a, is a one and a half million pound digitisation project. Welcome are effectively structuring the, um, uh, the, the the print heritage, the 19th century print heritage, and that's a very it's a very interesting uh, process in itself. So I really do, you know, it, it's yeah. not just the government. Yeah. In these these um, private funders are enormously influential as well. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point. There's something that's come out of the, 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 uh, the survey. Not massively, but it's definitely a trend there. But um, when people are talking, worried about, um, I think you talked about this, James, about kind of expensive furniture, you know, people putting in a lot of resources into the digital and then it becoming redundant and looking mm -hmm. on fashions two days later. And looking at these big funders as a way of trying to help them prove, future-proof yeah. their approach to the digital. So, well, look, you know, we don't really. You know, this this seems to be a good idea to us. But how do we know this is where the, this is the direction of travel? And how do we know that what? You know, where are we going to go with this in sort of two, three, four years time? But well, they're looking at kind of arts council uh, strategies, HLS strategies, in order to help them with that. Because it, precisely that, and it seems to me that in some ways the sector is really looking for that kind of shaping. It's sort of, it's kind of looking in, in order in order to kind of um, mitigate risk. Yes. No, I I agree. What worries me about the funders shaping is the funders are not the practitioners. And you know the practitioners respond to the funders who don't necessarily know, you know, the, the, the best practice and, and the funders tend to be quite conservative as well because they're following you know, best practice or what works, you know, and all of that kind of thing. So I think it, you know if you're doing a critical review, it would be really useful I think to bring out for the community to bring out some of those consequences. Of, of where some of the digital engagement is coming from. I think there's also a further aspect of the funding um, environment, uh, in, and I know this has been raised in reviews with the Heritage Lottery Fund in, in previous years, um, that a funder is always looking for innovation. Mm. If you have a really good project that is proof of concept, you can't go back to them for, for funding to do some more of the same, and another repository, another institution, would find it hard to say we like that we want to do it with our stuff because they would have to prove why theirs is different and so you, you what you can't get is that joining up of good practice you get um it's just i think is also you know it encourages innovation doesn't necessarily encourage you know we've proved this concept now let's just get on with it um and you so you get pockets of different approaches um that don't join up uh, which actually you could benefit or the user could benefit from a join up of different things being Done in the same way. I mean that, that feeds back really nicely to this the, the Research Libraries UK kind of the digital strategy which you mentioned is currently in progress. You know, 
is it actually helpful to to kind of compile these these you know very desirable, um, in most cases very necessary national strategies when the funding is kind of targeting change uh, and you know and piloting different kinds of projects across the sector rather than kind of necessarily speaking to the needs of of the sector who want kind of consistency wants a, a, a robust method for, yes. for empl employment yes. is actually being developed yeah. and that's a very interesting question because then the agenda of the funders really are constraining what's what's possible on a large scale even if they are innovating kind of from project to project yeah no, I think that's right mm. I would ask a question whether um necessarily fund something for which you might charge and yeah. so actually mm -hmm. in terms of commercial drive for organisations that need to fund their work you know, how, how does that work I and mean, that totally mm -hmm. skews what, what you can do because people are talking about free access mm -hmm. yeah yeah it is a tension actually it's one of the things that um rl uk in its we've, we've done some work in, in one area and looking trying to develop um, a digital, uh, a national digital agenda, and there is a real tension, particularly for the smaller, both the smaller um, heritage libraries and you know smaller um, museum things. That there is this tension over um, the the primacy of the Creative Commons license. That you know everybody that there is a culture that everything should be out there and everything should be free, whereas actually for some. Actually, the value is a monetary value in that in that collection and digitising, and somehow the relationship with with commercial organisations, Adam Matthews Digital, for example. Um, I don't know if that you can work there, but um, we certainly have worked with Adam Matthew, and Adam Matthew is is, is very important in certain other um, arenas. It did the math of the observation archive, for example, and the income that people get through licensing is often incredibly important to us, a, a small library or a small museum. So I think, you know, that, that, that whole funding framework um, would be worth just mapping out, I think, really. And I think that would kind of help us to unlock better the, the sort of complex relationship between economic and cultural value, which yeah. are obviously, you know, they're obviously intimately yeah. bound up with one another. And it's, I suppose, it's a question of where your priority lies in terms of the sustainability of these institutions versus making more open and accessible some of the resources which they have for, for kind of cultural benefit. So whilst acknowledging you're going to have to perhaps, um, that will enable, that will sort of force you to lose things in certain other areas. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's important for organisations of all sizes, I think, because I know the we get many tens of thousands, something like 40 or 50,000 pounds from the Bridgman Art Library um, yeah. and reproduction fees for our, our works from the Bond Walker Art Library. And um, quite honestly, that funds a part of our digitization program in mm. the Art Gallery. Yeah. That's, mm. that's the way it works. So we, we put things for free on, on the web and we put you know, decent, decent size images for people to use for education purposes. But if you want to print something and publish it, then that's, uh, that's chargeable. What's in the line, and it might be my listening, a slight disjunct between Katie and Stella in terms of you were talking a lot about the digital um, never replacing but being supplementary to the original, and then the comment around 2020. Yeah, mm. and throwing away. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, it, it's and it's interesting in the work, the projects that I'm doing with um, year 10, 11, 12, 13 students in terms of trying to get them to return to the original. Because one of our biggest challenges around the primary secondary is that, uh, for our undergraduates for example, the idea of them physically accessing special collections and the value of the difference between that and then looking at a, an extract which they can look at online, they don't get it. And we're trying, and through the, the extended project qualification, we're trying to get that back into the psyche of 15 and 16 year olds. That So for example, the work we've been doing with um, the 19th century collections, getting them to look at the Leeds Chronicle, first of all recognising that it's a newspaper, and then recognising the value of looking at an article amongst the context of other articles. Um, so there's that I want to sort of throw out, because there's that concept of, well, that is something we value within a 19th century collection, well surely in the 22nd century we'll be valuing that in a 21st century collection, and also the multi-sensory. 
One of my challenges with the digital is it takes away smell. And it takes away, at the moment, there's lots of different ways of doing it, touch, and I dare to admit it. But I say to all the kids when we come into special places, just smell the air, smell the paper. Because it's really important for them to understand the difference between looking at a Kelmscott edition of Morris in its actuality and looking at the way the paper has been forged through hand craftsmanship, because that tells us about the theories of hand craftsmanship, and looking at it online. Mm. So I think there's something around the notion of heritage, because the heritage is not just within the written word, or the way we read with word, it's how yeah. we see it. Yeah. And one of the things we say to our undergraduates, is that go look at the book, mm. you know, look at the front page, look at the acknowledgements, look at the first chapter, the second chapter, and then look at the piece that we've asked you to read on the VLE. But, so I think there's something within our critical view that we've got to think about, about how we determine the educational values of the future through some of these decisions we're making about digitalizing heritage. Can I just, I, I think what you've said is really, I, I think first of all, I'm sure Katie would, would have, and you know, Kate, Katie said that, that the, um, the physical is really important. I, I actually would say rather than the physical, I would say that the original, the rare and unique, um, the, the thing that is of significance is actually what's, what's important. Um, Kate is absolutely right, that, and, and you know, I used to wear, um, in another place, I used to wear um, the hat of Kate in a special collection myself, and um, I, I have seen and know exactly the power of standing next to um, you know, the earliest piece of the New Testament story. Was ever written on all you know these other other things. So I think that is I, I would completely be with you. I I think books are something else. And uh, what I would I, we are going through a transition. And what happened when we went through a transition from the manuscript to the print to movable metal type was that movable metal type mimicked manuscript. And we don't like change in the way that our, our formats are delivered. And at the moment, the digital book mimics the, um, the physical print book. And I suspect that that will happen for a while, but I suspect that actually our concept of the book will change. And I don't know where that will take us and what that will mean, but I think we've got another challenge to do with that. And Undoubtedly, it will. What will we won't lose print print books entirely, but print book because there is something physical about a book, the you know the opening, and, and some books are artworks in themselves. So the physical book will will remain, but it itself will become the object rather than the information, and the information kind of book may unpick in terms of format. So. You know, although we have the, the format that you, you, you um, express the forward, the contents, the this, the that, and the other, the chapters, I think that may change. I know, I think books will look like something comes back else. to this question of us as decision makers, which is the one that we do a lot with museum studies, is that idea of, as a curator, you're often in a very powerful yeah. role of making a decision of what will be valuable tomorrow, but also what will be valuable in 200 years' time, or 300 years' time. And that's what I think with that, and it's not about being middle-aged or being, I'm very good at standing up and saying, oh, I'm such a Luddite, I, you know, I'm not you know, a digital native in many ways. But actually, it's also about that really careful play, which I think we've got to try and get out in the critical view, that careful play between embracing what is possible, as you say, because our, the understanding of a young person using a Kindle is very different to an understanding of a young person picking up a copy of Donatart's The Goldfinch and going, oh my god, it's really heavy. Um, but how we make those decisions about what would be valuable in, two, in the same way that people make decisions around Shakespeare phobia. And uh, that's the bit that we've got to, we've got to worry more. Can I just come in just, just to support that point? You know, in my previous role, I worked as a teacher for 12 years. And when I started labeling and using you know, physical books was a big part of it. When I left, both schools I'd left did not labor in. It was all use of computers. And I think, you know, it's, uh, 
I take your point uh, about the way books are in the future will be different, but also thinking about these decisions. You know, we're talking here about funders and millions of pounds. You're working in secondary school, you're literally young, you're not talking about access to that kind of money. How will the digital age transcend into a secondary school? You know, yes, we got rid of libraries, replaced them with PCs, but we never got, we weren't digitalising books so that they could access them. We literally didn't access them anymore. They went on the internet, typed in a term, like you just said, oh, yeah, I've got the answer. Don't understand the context at all. So I think you're right about decisions now in, in the museum world uh, or libraries, but also does that affect, uh, you know, young people in the education sector who will come on to higher education or will come to museums? And it's future-proofing. Yeah. So it's not just about future-proofing the technology. It's about future-proofing the way we access information. And that was what always worries me about that. If you read this, you might like this. Is we're more and more removing the process of making that decision and talking to young people about how Google operates mm -hmm. and that sort of recognition when they suddenly realize that someone else is controlling. And so, and I, I mean, these big debates about politics at the moment and the way young people aren't saying no. And then there's a new range of young people coming through who actually are saying no, but saying no through Twitter and Facebook. And so I think it's just something in this, because the project is around cultural value, we've got to explore that value in terms of, of, of questioning, how we question through the processes. So it's, it's, a, diff it's a really, really difficult one. I think it's we better just draw a line there on, on that. Um, Thank you so much for that, that was incredibly uh, interesting. We're now moving on to a different area. Um, Hannah and Sophie are going to talk about company archives, is that okay? And, and you're going to mainly respond to the critical review, aren't you? Kind of, <laughs> yeah.